Welcome back, folks. This is a continuation of our previous discussion about user-defined function blocks. We'll review how the blocks are built using ladder logic and how they are linked into your main program. Speaking of programs, we're going to shift focus a bit and we're going to talk about how to design using the user-defined function blocks, how they are linked together to make a cohesive program. Let's start by taking a quick look at the Connected Components project tree. Otherwise known as the Project Organizer. The reason we look at this is because we need to know where the user-defined function blocks live. That project tree might look something like this. Under Programs, we find our Program Trio. Lower in that tree, we'll find the User Defined Function Blocks section. This is where we can add our blocks. For example, Function Block Tend Motor which we explored in the last lecture. Maybe a function block tend pneumatic cylinder. Soon we'll explore a function block for tending a pneumatic cylinder. Maybe a conversion function block. For example, you might want to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. As a homework problem, we looked at a function block for a cylindrical tank, where that tank was vertical not horizontal, because that's a different problem. And we also looked at a function block for on, off, control. Now that we have this representative project tree, let's go back to our original question. Where do the user-defined function blocks live? And the answer is they live in two places. First, we describe them in this section. You could say they are built and defined in this section. They are used here. They are instantiated. You know, we've been very fussy with the style in our program trio. Our in map is used to map a physical IO to a global variable. Our out map is used to map a global variable to a physical I.O. And program control is where all of our control logic takes place. So that's where you would expect to find a command that says tend to the motor or calculate the volume of a tank. Let's take another look at this function block, which is used to control and monitor a motor. We've used this example many times before, where we described a large three-phase contactor, which is physically coupled to an overload block, which is in turn connected to a three-phase motor. Affixed to the main contactor, you'll typically find an auxiliary contact that physically moves with the main contacts, but is electrically isolated. The general idea is that the PLC will control a coil that's associated with all of these contacts, and it will monitor the auxiliary contact to make sure that everything is good. Again, this is the motor starter coil, and this is the auxiliary contact. Recall that the overload block has a normally closed contact. This contact will open if there's a fault in the motor that causes too much current on any one of the legs for too much time. Should the overload contact open, it will disable the coil. When that coil is disabled, the PLC, which is monitoring this auxiliary contact, will detect that there has been a failure. 
And I would argue that this is a perfect application of a user-defined function block. This is the interface for that function block. If it's enabled, it will close the coil, which will activate the motor starter. After some time delay, because remember, it takes time for the contact to physically close. After that time delay, it will monitor the auxiliary contact. If the auxiliary contact is closed, which means the motor starter is active, the user-defined function block will signal to the rest of the program that the motor starter is valid. If it's not valid, it will signal a fault. Actually, it'll latch into a fault position until it is reset. This last output called busy is only active for a brief period of time. It is active when the block is enabled, but has yet to time out. So again, it's busy. It's waiting for some time to expire before it actually checks the auxiliary contact when it will signal either valid or fault. This is the user-defined function block interface. When we instantiate the block, this is the inputs and outputs. We could argue that this is a simplified interface. We could also argue that such things help with organization and simplification of the overall code. Again, this is the interface. Let's look at the other components of the user-defined function block. Again, we have the inputs, we have the outputs. Together, those are the interface. We have local variables, which are unique to that user-defined function block. And finally, we have the behavior, which is the code used to drive the block. These are hidden beneath the interface. So when we go back here, we see the interface. We see the inputs and the outputs. We do not see the local variables, and we do not see the code. This interface is an abstraction. It's a simplification of the actual code. In our last discussion, we described the general types of user-defined function blocks. These are classified as either level-sensitive or edge-sensitive. An example of a level sensitive is something with a Boolean enable paired with a Boolean enable out. And this would be a block that executes immediately. The other type of level sensitive block had an enable line coupled with a Boolean valid. And we described this as having a delayed output. Again, these were our level sensitive. Whenever enable is high, they will do their job. Whenever enable is low, they will stop doing their job. They are sensitive to the enable signal. The other type of user-defined function block is edge triggered. It has a Boolean trigger input. For our purposes, we'll assume that to be a rising edge. And that is coupled with a done pulse. For that, you can expect a delay, but not necessarily have to have one. And that was edge sensitive. There is some related I.O. that we should mention, including the Boolean busy, which will be active when the enable signal is true, but the block has yet to turn valid. Or in case of the edge sensitive, when the trigger has happened, but we're not yet ready to send the done pulse. There's a signal called Boolean abort. And that's typically associated with the edge sensitive blocks because you need a way to stop these blocks. Remember, they're started on a trigger. 
So edge sensitive block is started on a trigger and if necessary, it'll stop on an abort or it'll run to completion and signal that it's done with a done pulse. This mechanism is not necessary for level sensitive devices because they are only active when the enable is true. So as soon as enable goes false, that block is done. It stops working. The Boolean fault is an important output. That will be used if something goes wrong inside one of these blocks. For example, if a delayed level sensitive block cannot go to valid for some reason, it'll send a fault. And an edge sensitive will send a fault if there's some reason it can't send a done pulse. For instance, here, if the auxiliary contact never closes, this will send a fault to the rest of the system. Let's see how this goes together with an example. In this process, we have a tank that's filled with a liquid. Our motor one is our mix motor. On the outside of this tank, tightly coupled to the tank, we're going to coil pipe. We're going to then take this pipe and run it to a heater. Our motor number two is the pump. Finally, we'll add a temperature sensor to the bottom of the tank. For this process, it's important that the mix motor be turning at all times. If it is, we can activate the pump. If the pump is active, we can turn on the heaters, which are shown as electric coils inside this box. And finally, the temperature of the entire system is measured by the temperature sensor, which is coupled to the bottom of the tank, which should measure the temperature of the liquid. As we delve into the code, we define a few things. We say the machine has two motors. It's a thermal system. It would be useful if we had two different types of user-defined function blocks. The first one would be a function block to tend the motors. The other would be a function block for on-off control. Granted, that's certainly not the best way to do it, but we'll get to things like PID control next semester. It's helpful to consider the user interface. So we'll assume there's some kind of HMI here. That is a topic for another day. We'll assume there's a power switch, and we'll assume that there's a switch for the heater, and then an e-stop. Just so we're clear, the priorities were the mix motor has to run. That is our first priority that must always run. The second priority is the pump may be turned on. The last thing we do is turn on the electric heater, and we need some kind of mechanism to turn that electric heater on and off to regulate the temperature. And we'll do that using on, off control. If the heater is above the set point, it will turn off. If the heater is below the set point, it will turn on. We can describe those priorities graphically using a structure that looks like this. To that structure, we add bars. And these are do not proceed bars. For example, we do not want to proceed unless the power switch is turned on. So we can add that right here, global boolean switch on. Our next do not pass is a mix motor verification. So we'll assume there's a function block called tend motor We'll let that be the first one, dot x valid. The next thing to check is that our pump is operational. Let there be another function block, this time called tend 
motor, let that be number two, and we'll check the x valid. When all that is true, we can then proceed to the on-off control. From there, this structure will loop back on itself and will continue indefinitely. And you probably already observed this. This is function block tend motor. This is function block tend motor. And this is function block on off control. Once again, these bars are go, no go transitions. As an example, a failure of our mix motor will prevent the subsequent blocks from activating. This may look complicated, but it's actually quite simple, assuming the function blocks are already built. Let this be our Boolean global on switch. This first function block is function block tend motor, but it's instantiation number one, and this is for our mix motor. So Boolean able and Boolean valid. That feeds into another function block. This time it's function block tend motor, but now it's instantiation number two. This is for our pump. So it's enabled, and if all is well, it has a valid. And finally, we get to our last function block, which is function block on, off, control. That also has an enable, and it has a Boolean valid output. From here, it's very easy to see how the blocks depend on each other. If the on switch is enabled, our mix motor will be activated. As long as the motor starter starts and that auxiliary contact is closed within the specified amount of time, valid will become true, which will start our pump. If everything is well with the pump motor, it will signal the heater that it is okay to activate. And then this block will turn the heater on and off as necessary. A failure of any point in this chain will disable all subsequent blocks. So you could say that the overall behavior of the machine is dependent on how the user-defined function blocks are linked together. Let's shift to the workbench and see how this is all put together. We start with our program tree right here, where we see a micro 850. Actually, I'm using the simulator right now. We have our program control. Then we have the user-defined function blocks, including a function block called tend motor and a function block called on off control. We'll look at function block on off control because it's relatively simple. On rung one, if the device is enabled, the enable out will be true. The second rung says we will turn on the heater. In this case, it's called drive. We'll turn on the heater when our real input, which is the monitored temperature, is less than this scratch value. The scratch value is the set point minus hysteresis. When we get into process control, we'll find out why we need hysteresis. Basically, we don't want to toggle on and off very quickly about the set point. We want to turn on sometime below the set point, and then as the process temperature increases, we'll turn off when we've gotten to some point higher than the set point. The hysteresis is that difference from the set point plus or minus. Rung number three, we turn off the drive if our input is greater than scratch. Again, scratch is the set point plus the hysteresis. Our final rung is the default rung. It simply says, if you are not enabled, turn off the drive. Don't do anything. I believe we looked at this tend motor function block in our previous discussion. It goes something like this. On rung number two, it says, if you're enabled and not faulted, activate the coil for the motor starter. At the same time, if you are enabled, start a timer. When the time delay pickup 
has elapsed, we are considered to be steady running. If we are steady running, we jump back to rung number one. If we're steady running and not faulted, our output is valid. What's a fault? Well, a fault is determined down here in rung number five. It says if you are steady run and the auxiliary contact is not closed, right? For some reason, the motor starter contact has failed to close, then you are in a fault condition. That fault condition can be reset on rung number six. The last output is busy. It says if you're enabled, but not yet in a steady run condition, then signal that you're busy. Remember, these rungs describe the behavior of the function block. If we go over here and we hit parameters, we can see the interface for the function block. Here are the inputs. Here are the outputs. In the middle, we see the local variables that are associated with the function block. So remember, here, this user-defined functions block space in our program tree is where the function blocks are defined. The function blocks are instantiated or used over here in our case program control. Here is function block for motor number one. Here is the function block for tend motor number two. To simulate this code, we're going to turn on the power switch. But we have to be careful because we'll only have five seconds to close the auxiliary contact. If we don't do that, we're going to end up with a fault. Likewise, as soon as this goes valid, I'll have five seconds to close this auxiliary contact. If I don't, again, we'll have a fault. So let's give that a try. So we'll toggle the power switch. We can see that this is true. Then we toggle that. So that assumes the coil is activated. Now we're working on motor starter number two, and we need to toggle this, and there we are. We are in a run condition. You can see right here, function block 10 motor number two is valid. At this point, we can turn on the heater, and the drive for the heater is active. We'll change this temperature. We'll let that be 300, and the heater should still be on. Yep, it is true. We'll let it be 302, and it should now be false, because this heater will turn off when we have risen above the set point by this hysteresis value of 2. It will not turn on, right, so here we're back at 300, and the heater is still off. It will not turn on again until we've gone to the set point minus the hysteresis. So at 298, the heater will turn back on. Again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. This is an example of process control, and that's something we'll deal with next semester. Anywho, let's go back to rung number one and look at these motor starters. First, we need to slap Dolan on the wrist because you don't hold the reset button true. So that's step one. And what we're going to do now is we're going to come in here and we're going to turn off the auxiliary contact. We're going to simulate a failure where there's a broken wire or the motor overheats. And what you should see is that you have a cascade of everything after this. So number two should immediately shut down and the on off control for the heater should immediately shut down as soon as this fails. So let's find out. So instantly, we now have blue here. This is disabled. This is disabled. The heater is off. You notice there's a fault here. So tend motor number one has thrown a fault, and that is caught right here. System faults. We've latched it in. So now, even if the operator were to power it down and power it back up again, the fault is still there. You would actually have to go in, well, in this case, because of the way it's written, you'd have to power the entire machine down. So let's go ahead and reset this. One more thing I'd like to draw your attention to, and that is the fact that these instantiations are 
unique. They are not related to each other. For instance, you'll notice that this one here, number one, is faulted, but number two is not faulted. We can open number one and examine the code. You can see that this is in a fault condition. Whereas, if we go to number two and open that up, you can see that it is not in a fault condition. So that's one way that you can troubleshoot your code. It makes life a little easier. Also, since this is an active simulation, you can see the colors that are typically associated with that. You have blue for rungs that evaluate as false, and red for pieces that evaluate as true. And that's interesting because when we compare it to this, which is the user-defined function block definition, you'll see that there's nothing red or blue about it at all because this is the definition. It is never active. It's only the instances that are active. All right, let's recap this. We have a function block. This is the interface to the function block. Inputs, outputs, local variables. This is the description of the behavior for that function block. The function block is instantiated in our main programs. Here you can see the interface. There's the inputs, there's the outputs. If you wanted to, you could go to local variables, that is local to your program, and you can see the instances of your function blocks. You can even drill down and see what and what is not available to you. 